1945, Volkswagen began mass producing a car that would eventually become one of the most popular cars ever built. Originally called the Type 1, we all know it as the Beetle. Reliable and economical, the Beetle was relatively easy to maintain and repair, and parts were easy to come by. In all, Volkswagen built over 21 million Beetles before retiring the original design in 2003. In 1955, Beetle number 903847 rolled off the line, and it was going to travel a bit further than most. see what the cities looked like in 1945. This is your image of a town. So you can imagine that when that is your background, your expectations of what you can do with your life were very low. I had to make my way out of what became the Soviet occupation zone in Germany. That took me two tries to eventually get out. I had started to go to university in Germany in 1949 when they opened up. And in my first year, there was the first student exchange to England. As you can imagine, there was a fierce competition among about 100 people who wanted to go, and I was one of the lucky ones, and I actually got there. I saw in England, in the newspaper, an ad for uh, wanting apple pickers in Nova Scotia. So I went to the Canadian High Commission and applied for immigrating to Canada from England. I had a map of Canada, and I had made a circle where I would like to be, southern BC. A telegram was handed to me from the Labour Ministry that uh, ex-people and me were supposed to go on to Nelson, BC. So I, was, I got exactly where I wanted to go. <laughs> At that time, in the mid-50s, they were talking about the so-called Pan-American Highway. So then I thought, OK, I'll get myself a car and I'll drive along. Below is the Pan-American Highway, which will eventually run from Alaska to the tip of South America. Here in Chile, where it hugs the rugged Chilean coastline, a huge modernization project is underway. That basically gave me the idea where, we, where you can go, but that's just the technical aspect. Then you have to take into account the, the climate change or the weather, the season. Then, of course, technically, it's uh, do you have the money and do you have a car that will do that? The Beetle is the only thing. <laughs> the Beetle, by the time we are talking here now, 57, was well established, not just as a nice car, but in terms of durability. It also is simple, if I may say so, which appealed to me. I'm a bit of a mechanic, but I'm not a master mechanic, you know? So that was the big thing. It was robust. It was relatively cheap. And it was cheap to operate because it had a low gas consumption. When you are planning a trip from Canada to more or less all of South America, it's important when you go in terms of temperature. Now, much of that is hot, and especially the second trip in Africa is even worse. So you need something where you can rely on the engine being cooled. All right. If you have a regular water-cooled car, you must have access to water because it's going to boil off, you know? So with the beetle, you don't have that problem. I had to have water, but for me to drink, <laughs> not for the car. I always didn't like the idea to have to drag a tent along, and you need a, you know, a couple of trees or something to, to fasten your tent to. 
So the idea came to make it into a camper. And then, <laughs> again, the beetle isn't all that big, but I found out when you take all the seats out, it's six feet from the firewall to the, to the back, and I'm only five, seven, I guess. So the idea became feasible only after having convinced myself that I can live in the car. I made a sort of a rough plan before going on each trip. The freight charges for my car on the freighters was something like half of my expense. And of the remaining half, something like three quarter was for gasoline. The rest was for me to live on, which was not much. <laughs> it was tight, you know. But if I hadn't been able to use my car as a hotel, I couldn't have done it. One hotel night would have wiped out a month's budget, you know? Setting out from Trail, BC, Paul began what would be the first of three very ambitious trips on December 2nd, 1957. In 196 days, he drove south through the United States, Mexico, Central and South America, sailed east to Lisbon from Argentina and then toward Europe. In all, he had traveled 61,800 kilometers, which is about one and a half times around the Earth, by the time he returned to Canada by ship. Not knowing what to expect out of the first trip, he named his car Fe on Dios, or Faith in God. On trip two, with a better idea of what he was getting himself into, Paul named the car Malgré II, or Despite It All. Setting out in 1961, he covered 60,800 kilometers in 183 days, sailing from the southern U.S. to West Africa, traversing the continent to the east, then sailing from South Africa to Perth, Australia. From there, he crossed the continent and sailed back to Canada from Sydney. For the third and final trip, he named the car Once More, covering 63,500 kilometers in 172 days, between December 66 and May 67, he sailed to Thailand from San Francisco and drove through Southwest Asia, the Middle East, and finished with another tour of Europe before sailing to Montreal. something is a difficult task unless you have official papers and unmistakable pictures. You have to have a tripod, you have to have a self-timer, and you have to have a place where you can do that. Some countries only allow you in with your camera with a certain number of rolls of film. You can't have 20 rolls of film. So you have 700 some pictures for a six month period. If you look it out, it came down to about three a day. So if you take five the first day, <laughs> you only have one left for the next day. If you take a landscape picture, unless there is a sign here in Timbuktu, it, nobody can prove that. So I have a number of photographs which show me standing against the signpost, because that's the only, the only thing. While roads were underdeveloped for large stretches of the trip, many were extremely punishing on the car, and one of the biggest concerns throughout Paul's travels was damage caused to the car in remote areas. If he wasn't able to fix the problem himself, he'd have to figure out how to get to the nearest mechanic, and then just hope they could find the right parts. The closest to the trip ending involuntarily was when I broke the torsion bar. It is not supposed to be breakable. And I broke it. <laughs> you know, so the people in the Volkswagen station were absolutely flabbergasted that they had never seen a broken torsion bar. The other one I mentioned already, when the drive wheel went, you, you don't move, period. You know, so unless you get a new drive wheel, you're not going anywhere. And here the good Lord again, I mean, I got towed to this station in Vamaco, and lo and behold, they had a cannibalized beetle sitting there. So they took the drive wheel out of that engine and put it in mine. I mean, here again, the chances of finding a drive wheel in the middle of West Africa was not very great.
And I think it was the sound of the engine because uh, that sound, that really um, brings me back to when I was a little kid. It was always a sign of my father coming back safely from somewhere. He was kind of like this exotic visitor and he had stories to tell. It made our lives, you know, a little bit different, a little bit more exciting than they might have been in Trail BC without that. It might not have always been convenient, you know, certainly not for my mother, but um, because she had to look after the two little kids when he was gone, you know, often for six months at a time. But it's something that I can't imagine my father being happy without doing that. He was very attached to everything connected with the family, in particular with me, because my, our elder brother, we were three brothers and two sisters, and the elder brother was um, uh, killed during the war. So I was now the older brother for Wolfgang. I was the, and he had a particular um, affection for me as being the older brother, and I had a particular affection for him as my little brother, the little one. He sometimes also I mean, may not have considered too much what, what happened to his own family. It was his mission. It was a, 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 an urge for him to do that. For whatever reason, it was his mission. It's very unusual that someone would have done it in a car like that with a shoestring budget. You know, he had to figure out himself if his car broke down, how to fix it, how to get out of the situation. So that kind of uh, self-reliance, I think, is, is the real core of the story for me. It's not what he did, it's how he did it, the circumstances under which he did it. The traveling is not really the unusual part. The unusual part is the, the time in which it happened and the fact that it was just little old me. There are several deserts that I have crossed. I was alone for the entire stretch. You had maybe one truck a day coming by. If I had to do it over again, I would really want to have a buddy with me because you want to share the experience and you want to reminisce uh, 50 years later, you know? The date of 25th of March, 1958, will always remain in my memory. Here, halfway between Punta Delgada and Punta Arenas at 53 degrees south, at the end of the world, a cloud of dust appeared from the opposite direction and then approached, shrouding a jeep inside. Both vehicles stopped and then reversed towards each other. And lo and behold, it was my brother. That's when we met the first time, not just on that trip, but the first time in 12 years. And he knew that I would be in Punta Arenas. We did not know exactly where we would meet. And suddenly, here it came that we came together like a magnet and a piece of iron or whatever, you know, this way, attracted and in this middle of nowhere, there we, we, we found each other and fell into each other's arms and that was really wonderful. It was a most, you know, one of those momentous events in, 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 in one's life. The week that we had together was uh, cloud nine, you know. It was emotional because it was so almost impossible. And yet it was possible. Four years later, we met in, in Canberra, also on the road. But it was still a wonderful, a wonderful meeting and a wonderful time we had together. And then, of course, we met in Thailand um, three and a half years after that. Each of these three trips, we had anywhere from one to three weeks together. So in. In that space of my three trips, we each met. You know. So you can see he had quite a role to play in all that. I had uh, written to Volkswagen. It was the 26th of May that I was in Toronto. So I had five days to make it from Toronto to um, Trail. 
That's when the car was put on the hoist and I asked the opinion of the chief mechanic, can I do that? And he said, no way. <laughs> I think they were all impressed because the car looked like it had suffered. <laughs> we can offer the following deal. You let us have the car, and for that, we fly you home. So it was a wrenching decision to have to part with it. It's like a long lost friend, you know? <laughs> After selling his car back to Volkswagen for $110, the price of a plane ticket back to trail, Paul also sold publicity rights to Volkswagen's advertising agency for $25, and the car was displayed in Volkswagen dealerships and at the 1967 Canadian National Exhibition. In 1968, it was also part of the German Pavilion in the Man and His World Exhibition in Montreal. Volkswagen Canada exhibited it, or a photograph of it, I'm not too sure which, in New York in some sort of a contest. After that, I must say, I lost track of it. It took me 18 years to find uh, the 1955. When I saw for the first time the ad with the pictures of the 55, it's like a, almost when you see a woman in, in the street and you say, this one is for me, I would marry her. And uh, when I saw the car, I, I know it was for me. It's just like a, a feeling and uh, you just know. <laughs> My name is Ruth Bartels, and uh, my husband uh, was Klaus Bartels, and we met at Volkswagen. My husband bought the Beetle, I believe, in 1973 from Volkswagen. Klaus Bartels was uh, taking care of the car for uh, Volkswagen, and after when they decided to, to sell it, they sold it uh, to him, and uh, he was doing everything uh, by himself. Everything was authentic, like it, it, it didn't have parts that didn't belong to it on it, you know. When you have a vintage car, you have to take care of it. You have to store it properly. You, you really do have to take care of it, and I just wasn't prepared to do that. I had a lot going on. I put the car on Kijiji, and I get this phone call out of the blue. Uh, I want that car. I'm, I want that car. Don't let anybody even look at that car. Don't let them come near that car. And I thought, this man's a lunatic. And I told her, I know, this is my car. And uh, about five days later, I went uh, down to Scarborough and went to buy the car. I assumed they were going to tow it. I said, so, you know, like, do you, have a, you don't have a tow bar or anything. How, how are you going to get the car back? I'm going to drive it back. I said, are you crazy? Like, I don't even know for sure if the brakes are good, you know. Oh, no, 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 it's fine. And I said, I don't even know if the lights work. You know, it's going to be dark. You know, this is very dangerous. Oh, no, no, I know these cars. I can drive. And I thought, this guy's, you know, he overconfident, you know. And I was really worried about him, you know. I spoke to the car <laughs> and told the car she's going to drive me to Montreal. <laughs> I could see he really liked it. He was very enthusiastic, and I knew he would take care of it. And he was a, a bug enthusiast, so that was important to me. He was respectful of the car, and I liked that. But I'll tell you, you do feel disrespectful, you know, when you sell something that somebody loved. And you do, you know, it, it gives you some cause for thought, you know, you don't feel good about it. And a lot of things I kept for my son, but then he passed away too, so that was just at the point where you have to do these things, you know. I got um, once again uh, Canada Magazine, and um, there was a little post-it on one picture telling it was my car, and saying my car went three times around the world with Paul uh, Loof. And I just went on the internet to check for Paul Loof, and uh, I called him. I asked him, do you used to own a 1955 uh, Beetle? He told me, yes, why? Your car is still on the road. And at the time, like, he started to laugh like for at least one minute and couldn't believe.
the summer of 2013, with nearly 300,000 kilometers on the odometer of the 58-year-old Beetle, Emmanuel drove from his home in Northern Ontario to Ottawa to surprise Paul and reunite him with his car for the first time since 1967. <laughs> oh boy. Would be Monsieur Tourier? Yeah. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> nice <laughs> to meet you. Same here. <laughs> Your car. <laughs> a very car, yes. A slightly different color, but it's the same yeah. car. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Gee. That is amazing. I guess he wasn't like this at uh, the Cerda <laughs> <third> Tour. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you one thing. There were days when you couldn't even see the engine because of all the dust. Yeah. That you suck in, and then you know it's all one great mass. You know, well, well, well. That makes me sentimental, you know. Yeah, you know. <laughs> you want to see it in it? <laughs> well, this has seen a lot of family history. Like I say, my two kids spend a lot of time in the back seat. All right. Anyway, I got to get out before I start crying. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Smile. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder what my father really was doing. Um, I think that he's a very uh, literal man, and when you talk to him, he always speaks in facts and figures, and he recounts details. But I, um, I was thinking, what drives a person to do that? It's, it's deeper than just um, a, a need to see if, if it can be done. I think um, there's a sense of adventure, but I also think that he is searching for something. And um, he's had a very displaced life. He's had to leave East Germany. His family has been separated by the, the post-war situation. So I think there's, there's a reason his memoir is called At Home in Three Worlds. The only thing I would change is maybe he's not quite at home in any of those three worlds. And I think that's one of the reasons he keeps traveling. I think he's still sort of searching for that home base. Um, because he's been displaced and so now he, you know, he displaces himself and he, uh, he travels the world and I think on some level um, he won't stop because he never really has that place to, to return to. And even recently we took a, a trip last summer to our family home in, in Trail BC and the house itself was gone and I think that really moved him because it's that sense that nothing is permanent and there is really no place you can keep returning to except yourself. He also probably did it a bit to, to impress people you know, by what he did, by, by his daring trips and, and, and the most uh, amazing adverse circumstances. He had a, uh, you know, a, only one person alone is, is against the whole world. It's a great experience to be driven in my own car after so yeah. many years. <laughs> It's hard to explain why I did it. I think it takes a special kind of nutty people to want to go on and stick their nose where it doesn't belong. <laughs> I happen to be one of them. <laughs> um, it gives you a feeling of the whole world is your oyster. You have a car that works and you could actually go where you wanted. And if you take that attitude, then the sky is the limit, you know. I'm getting a little um, proud about it because I have reason to believe that nobody 
at least not no Canadian has done it in that fashion three times alone in the same car. And I think that's unique and it's likely to stay unique. The story started in 1955. It's about a car that connected one man to his brother and the world and inspired two other men to preserve it. It's a story about a Volkswagen Beetle, 903847, that has yet to finish. <laughs>